so we're going to talk this morning about antepartum and interpartum fetal assessment because I think as an anesthesiologist, it's really important that you have an understanding of the fetal heart tracing because that can help you in terms of managing the labor and delivery floor and knowing if that tracing doesn't look good. And so when they come up to you and say, oh, we want to do this postpartum tubal, you can look at the board and say, well, there's someone on the board having late B cells and we've only got one anesthesia person, so no, we're not going to start a postpartum tubal to right now. So um, fetal heart rate monitoring is a lot like EKG monitoring in terms of interpreting it. You need to be systematic. So the parameters that you want to look at, and the way I do it is I, I start with this and just go down. So the baseline heart rate, so we'll talk about what's a normal heart rate, then the variability, the periodic patterns, which refers to the decelerations and the accelerations, and then in terms of uterine activity, especially with the D cells, you need to look at the timing of when they're occurring in relation to the, the contractions, and that's why your fetal heart rate monitoring also has to include um, monitoring of uterine activity. So essentially a normal baseline fetal heart rate is considered to be anywhere between 110 to 160. Anything over 160 is considered fetal tachycardia. Anything below 110 is considered fetal bradycardia. Now, some babies, though, you know, they have a set baseline. Another thing to sort of look at is whether there's a change in the baseline. So if you have someone whose baby was running in the 140s and now the baseline is down around 110, well, that can be concerning. So you have to look not only at what the baseline is, but if there's been a change in the baseline. So our concerns with bradycardia and tachycardia are that they can be signs of fetal hypoxia, but it can be signs of other things, so that's what you need to understand. So if you have a tachycardic baby, it may be because mom is septic or febrile. Um, she could be have thyrotoxicosis. Some of the drugs that we and the obstetricians give can cross the placenta and cause a fetal tachycardia also. So uh, beta mimetics, if they give terbutaline, say mom's hypertonic, and they want to calm down the uterus and give terbutaline, you could see fetal tachycardia as a result of that. If you've given lots of ephedrine to maintain blood pressure, or if you've given atropine because mom's become bradycardic, say with a neuroxial block, those can also lead to fetal tachycardia. But it, it can be difficult, but what you're trying to do is differentiate those causes from um, chronic fetal asphyxia because that can be another etiology of fetal tachycardia is that you do have inadequate uterine placental perfusion, which then means you're going to have to proceed with um, thinking about going to deliver. In terms of fetal bradycardia, um, that can be a sign of acute fetal asphyxia and fetal acidosis. There are other etiologies, though. One is local anesthetic toxicity, and this um, is particularly the case with paracervical blocks. So just to know for, like, your, your board exams, a paracervical block actually, if you did it, would provide analgesia for the first stage of labor. Uh, but you generally don't see any obstetricians ever doing that because there is an association with a much higher rate of fetal bradycardia. Um, maternal beta blockers can cause fetal bradycardia, so just be aware of that. That doesn't mean that you avoid uh, a beta blocker if the patient needs it. Um, you will see that for hypertension and blood pressure control, they usually preferentially use labetalol, and that is because it's a combined alpha and beta blocker. So uh, I'm not aware of any case reports of like fetal bradycardia after using labetalol. But there definitely are case reports of fetal bradycardia after using pure beta blockers like metoprolol, propanolol, things like that. And then finally, another etiology of bradycardia can be congenital heart block. There's really not much you can do about that other than to be aware of it. And that will sometimes result in a baby having to be delivered via C-section um, just because they're unable to adequately monitor the baby. So they don't know if it's because there's some problem going on with uterine placental perfusion or if it's just the baby's congenital heart block. So sometimes those patients will go ahead and um, be delivered via C-section. So once you've determined if you've got a normal baseline fetal heart rate, then you want to look at your heart rate variability. And this is one of the most sensitive indicators of fetal well-being. Um, and that is why sometimes you may hear the obstetricians or the nurses talking about, well, we're seeing some D cells, but there's good variability in between, and so they're not particularly concerned. Because 
it is probably the most sensitive indicator for your well-being if you have um, normal heart rate variability. And so what that refers to is um, the reason that it's important is that it's a sign that you've got normal intact pathways um, from your cerebral cortex, midbrain, vagus nerve, and cardiac conduction system. Um, and in the setting of fetal hypoxemia, you can lose that variability. So that's why they watch that so closely. Um, essentially, they define it as a, a measure of the fluctuation in your baseline fetal heart rate of, of over two cycles in, per minute. And they quantify the variability looking at the amplitude from the peak baseline down to the trough of baseline. So that is how um, fetal heart rate variability is determined. The reality is, is that generally it's it's more of a gestalt of looking. I imagine with an internal fetal scalp electrode, there may be a way to actually measure, but I've never seen on our monitors that anyone's like doing anything quantitative. It's more of a looking at um, how that variability looks. And so um, you can have absent variability, which means that um, essentially there's, there's, it's a straight line, and that is very concerning. Even if baby's not having D cells, if you go out there and it looks like a straight line, you can be sure they're going to be thinking about delivery soon. Minimal um, heart rate variability is when that amplitude range is less than five beats per minute. Moderate, which is generally considered what is normal, is between a range between six and 25. And then um, marked variability, which can also be a concern depending on what else you're seeing on the fetal heart rate tracing is um, an amplitude range that's greater than 25 beats per minute. Um, and this is just showing you an example of that fetal heart rate variability. Um, things to understand though in terms of what can cause decreased beat to beat variability. Well, your concern is, is that it could be fetal hypoxia and acidosis. Um, but also babies can sleep and so it could be a fetal sleep cycle. The other thing to understand is that um, premature babies do not have a fully mature nervous system. And so well, when you have very preterm babies like less than 28 weeks, you can't really reliably talk about fetal heart rate variability in those babies in terms of how it relates to whether or not you're concerned about fetal hypoxia and acidosis because they just will not have much variability um, at that point in time. Um, but also need to be aware that a lot of the drugs that we use as anesthesiologists can decrease your beat to beat variability. And that's important to know because then if they're concerned about variability, um, is it because we're concerned about fetal hypoxia or is it a drug that we gave? And so what I generally recommend is if you can, if you're in a situation where there is a concern about how the tracing's been looking, that's probably not the time to decide to give a bolus of fentanyl through the epidural, for instance. So your opioids, your, your barbiturates, your volatile anesthetics, benzodiazepines, anticholinergics will all decrease fetal heart rate variability. So one take home message from this is, is if you ever doing a general anesthetic, say in the main OR, for a pregnant patient and they are doing fetal heart rate monitoring, you no, and you need to let whoever's responsible for watching that monitor, it's usually a labor and delivery nurse, know that your drugs are going to take out the variability. So you really can't comment on fetal heart rate variability when you're doing intra-op fetal monitoring in a woman under general anesthesia. All you really can comment on is the baseline fetal heart rate and whether or not there are any periodic patterns like accelerations. So in terms of the opioids, your, your infusion through your epidural, two mics per cc of fentanyl, that's not going to affect variability. But, you know, sometimes I talk about, you know, someone in advanced labor who's having a lot of intense pressure that's bothering her. Sometimes a bolus of like 50 mics of fentanyl can help with that epidurally. Now, that large of a dose epidurally, though, can affect your variability. So, like I said, if she's, you know, eight centimeters and she's really having intense pressure but she's also having these deep variables because sometimes you see that when they're in advanced labor that would not be the time that I would give um, opioid because then if they're having the deep variables and now you've knocked out very variability beat to beat variability they're going to be really concerned and that's going to lead them to more likely decide that they have to do something like a c-section so the periodic patterns, we mostly talk about decelerations, but accelerations 
are actually um, something you can look for to help you reassure that the baby's doing well. So acceleration is generally defined as a fetal heart rate increase of at least 15 beats per minute, um, usually in association with either fetal movement or uterine contractions. Um, and so generally, if you have accelerations, you, you feel good. You, you're not going to be concerned about accelerations. On the other hand, if you're not seeing accelerations, that's not going to be a sign that you've got to go deliver the baby. Um, but what we're more interested in are the decelerations, and there's three types. Early decelerations, and essentially these, these are decelerations that essentially mirror the, the uterine contraction. So essentially the onset and the peak of the deceleration will occur in conjunction with the onset and the peak of the contraction. They are generally not deep, so you will usually not see your heart rate drop below 100 beats per minute. Variable decelerations are exactly as they're described. With each contraction, they're going to look different in terms of how deep they are, how long they last, um, how quickly they come on, and they can be quite deep. So it's common with a variable to see the heart rate drop below 100 beats per minute. And then finally, a late deceleration um, is, as it's described, essentially it doesn't begin until after the peak of the contraction. Um, like early decelerations, they usually don't drop very deep. They're usually, heart rate usually stays above 100 beats per minute. And so it can sometimes be tricky differentiating early versus late decelerations, which is important because they're two very different situations in terms of what they, their interpretation of. So this is an example of early decelerations, um, variable decelerations, and then late decelerations. Um, so it's important, like if you ever take boards, or you know, this might even be something they do on OSCEs now, I don't know, but um, they ask you to interpret a fetal heart tracing. Well, you know, it's not usually going to be the easy question that this is an early, late acceleration or variable. It's going to be like, what's what's causing this. So essentially early decelerations are felt to result from um, a vagal reflex of the baby um, due to head compression during contractions and that's why it mirrors the contraction. They're not concerning, they're not going to do anything about it, you don't have to treat an early deceleration in any way. Variable decelerations are also a vagal response and in the vast majority of those they're caused by umbilical cord compression so that can be concerning. Um, now, late in labor, you also can see variables due to the intense dural stimulation as the fetal head gets compressed as it traverses through the birth canal. Um, so the thing to understand with variables are that um, an occasional variable decel that's short of duration, it's not real deep, it returns to baseline quickly, they're usually not going to get concerned about that. That's really a sign they're like, oh, are they maybe in transition? Maybe we need to check her and see if she's ready to push. Um, but if you're having recurrent variable D cells and, you know, they're dropping down to like 40 or 50 and they're taking a really long time to return to baseline, well, those are going to be of concern. And it makes sense if you think about the pathophysiology of it. It's umbilical cord compression. So if you're having you know, cord compression that long with every single contraction, there's going to be a point where that baby's reserve is going to be gone, and now you can be looking at just straight fetal bradycardia. Um, and so they are going to be concerned about a tracing that has deep recurrent variable decelerations. And then late decelerations uh, result from inadequate uterine placental perfusion. So they're always concerning. And what's, what can be deceiving about late decelerations is they can be subtle. It can be a drop of just 5 to 10 beats per minute. But even when they are subtle late decelerations, it's still a sign of inadequate uterine placental perfusion. So that is what they're going to be most concerned about is late decelerations. Um, Initial management is essentially in utero resuscitation. You know, you're going to see them put oxygen on the mother, make sure she's on her side, maybe get a fluid bolus. You want to check the blood pressure. Sometimes that's one thing that the nurse might forget about is, you know, if you have an epidural on board, is her blood pressure low? And so if it is below what her baseline has been and she's having late decelerations, then you want to, to treat that with um, fluid and a vasopressor. Now, over the last um, five or so years, it used to be we just talked about what the baseline was, the variability, whether or not they're having D cells. Now they're being more um, quantitative or more systematic about it. 
and they now have categories of tracing. So you'll hear the opticians talking about a category one tracing or category two. So category one tracing is essentially, it's a normal tracing. And essentially for that moment in time with that tracing, it's very predictive of normal fetal acid base status. So nothing you need to do. Category two, the problem is you see a lot of category twos, it's not all that helpful because essentially it's an indeterminate tracing. So um, it's not necessarily predictive of abnormal fetal acid base status. So if you have a category two tracing, that doesn't mean you have to deliver the baby immediately. On the other hand though, it doesn't give you enough evidence to say that this is a normal tracing or an abnormal tracing. So the obstetricians, a category two tracing in conjunction with other things may decide that they need to, to do a cesarean delivery. And um, if you look at that uh, email I sent out earlier this week with the categories of C-sections, you'll see that I, I think, um, you know, category two tracing with other considerations could be considered an indicated case where you need to get that section done like within four hours. And then category three, this is clearly an abnormal tracing. It is predictive of having an abnormal fetal acid base status at that point in time. It's gonna require prompt evaluation and, and um, case, some cases will require prompt delivery. And in fact, I think category three tracing is one of the ones on that, those levels that would be an urgent, which means you wanna have her in the OR within like 30 minutes. Um, so what's going to be typical category one tracing? Well, you're going to have a normal fetal heart rate baseline. You're going to have um, the mo moderate fetal heart rate variability. You may or may not have accelerations. As I said, if you have them, great, but not having accelerations doesn't mean there any there's anything wrong. You may or may not have the early decelerations, but if you have any variables or late decelerations, automatically it is no longer a category one tracing. Um, in terms of a category two tracing, um, you can have some mild fetal bradycardia, um, but only um, if you also have normal variability with it. If you have um, bradycardia and absent variability, then it becomes a category three tracing. Um, you can have tachycardia with a category two tracing. Your variability with a category two tracing will either be minimal or it'll be absent but not having any D cells or it will be increased um, and in terms of accelerations, you won't see accelerations when they try to stimulate the baby. So sometimes they will do things like um, acoustic stimulation or um, fetal scalp um, stimulation, looking for accelerations. If they do that and they don't have accelerations, that will put you into a category two tracing. Um, in terms of the decelerations, so if you're having recurrent variables with minimal or moderate variability, um, that will make you a category two tracing. Um, if you're having variables, um, any variables that are like slow to return to baseline, you have to have an overshoot, which is not considered good, which means that you actually sort of have an acceleration of at least 20 beats per minute lasting for at least 20 seconds after the D-cell. That's an overshoot. That can be concerning. Or if you have shoulders before and after the D-cell. So essentially you have a small blip up, then you have your D-cell, and then a blip back up again before you get back down to your baseline. Those are considered shoulders those will put you into a category two. If you have a D-cell um, that's greater than two minutes but recovers within 10 minutes, that puts you into a category two tracing. Um, and if you have recurrent late D-cells but you still have moderate variability, that's a category two. So that's why, like I said, you may see some things where, oh, she's having recurrent late, so why are we not going to the LR right now? Well, if they've got moderate variability because that is probably the best indicator of fetal well-being, they're gonna hold off and consider that a category two. Category three, um, if you have absent variability and um, any other of the following, either recurrent lates, recurrent variables, or bradycardia, um, then that is a category three tracing. It essentially very predictive that you probably have fetal hypoxia, acidosis going on and then moving quickly to deliver that baby. The other category three tracing is that of a sinusoidal pattern, which you don't see very often, but if you see a sinusoidal pattern, that is a category three tracing also. 
So those are that's what you're going to do in terms of anti antipartum assessment is generally the fetal heart rate monitoring. Now sometimes you'll see on the board someone's having MSTs or you hear someone's being admitted because of a biophysical profile. So I think it's um, it's good to have a general understanding of what all that means. Probably not as important as knowing how to look at the fetal heart rate monitor. So non-stress test um, essentially is just looking at changes in fetal heart rate pattern over time. Um, it's inaccurate though, like I mentioned, variability um, is, is hard to, to document in an early baby. Um, it's also inaccurate um, in terms of non-stress tests if they're less than 28 weeks due to the fact that they have an immature autonomic nervous system. Um, generally though, a non-stress test is really a screening test. And they generally will use it in patients where they have some sort of underlying condition that you're more concerned that there could be inadequate uterine placental perfusion. Um, and so preeclamptic. So someone, for instance, we've had people on the board that are sitting here with preeclampsia, but they're, you know, maybe 30 weeks. And so they don't want to deliver them unless they have to. And so they will do non-stress tests. They will, you know, if you have someone that um, is being watched as an outpatient with blood pressures, they'll usually have to come in two or three times a week to have a non-stress test. Diabetics are known to um, oftentimes have uterine placental insufficiency, so if you have diabetes, be it gestational or pre-existing, at a certain point in the pregnancy, I, I think once you get to like third trimester, they start doing non-stress tests at least once a week to, to assess for that. Um, and then the other one is post-AIDS pregnancy. We don't see as much of this anymore because most obstetricians now, once they get to 40 weeks, if they haven't delivered, they'll induce them unless they have like a really unfavorable cervix. But as you get beyond 40 weeks, that placenta can just kind of poop out. And so um, they would do a non-stress test to see whether or not they think they, you know, if someone did have a closed, thick cervix, they might do a non-stress test to say, are we comfortable letting her continue on, knowing that, because if we induce her now and she's got an unfavorable cervix, she'll probably end up with a C-section. Um, so that's another case where they will do it. And essentially what they do is they put her on the monitor and they're gonna record your fetal heart rate and uterine activity for anywhere from a 20 to 40 minute period. And what you're looking for is whether or not there are periodic changes. So if you have an, a reactive NST, that indicates you've got a baby that's doing uh, well. Um, if you have a non-reactive NST, then essentially that means that um, you probably need to do additional testing. You're not going to go straight to, we need to deliver her right now because she has a non-reactive NST. Because at term, um, in women with non-reactive NSTs, only 20% of those actually have poor fetal outcomes. So the vast majority of the baby is actually still doing okay. Um, so what is a reactive NST? Well, you put her on the monitor. Um, generally over a 20-minute period, and if you have two or more accelerations over that period, it's considered reactive. And if they don't see anything over 20 minutes, they will sometimes extend to 30 or 40 minutes um, looking again for those accelerations. And depending on their gestational age, you're um, looking for um, different increases. So at 32 weeks and above, pretty much you've got a, a more mature autonomic nervous system, you want to see increases of fetal heart rate of at least 15 beats per minute that last for at least 15 seconds, two of those. Um, with the less, um, with the more premature babies, you're looking more for an increase of 10 beats per minute for at least 10 seconds. Um, also, if you have decelerations occurring during that non-stress test, um, even if you have some accelerations, you're probably going to go on and do something like a biophysical profile to further reassure yourself whether or not you think that baby's doing okay. So the biophysical profile or BPP, essentially it's an ultrasound exam. And they're looking, and again, they put that ultrasound on there and they sit there with the ultrasound on looking at the baby for anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes. And what they're looking for is they're looking for whether there's fetal breathing movements, whether there's just gross body movements, whether there's, um, they're looking at fetal tone, so movements that are essentially extension, returning back to flexion. And then, so those are all signs of like the acute status of the baby. But they're also looking at amniotic fluid volume because that is a way that you can measure sort of what's going on chronically. So if you 
have low amniotic fluid volume, that can be a concern that there's something going on chronically in terms of um, oxygen delivery. And so for each of those variables, you either um, get two points if it's normal or zero points if it's not. And so they um, essentially, for each one, breathing movements, they want to see at least one episode during the time of 30 minutes. Um, so if they have that, they get two points. If they either have no fetal breathing movements or none of their, the episodes are of breathing last for at least 30 seconds, they'll get zero points. Gross body movements over 30 minutes, they want to see at least three discrete movements. Um, if they have less than three, then they don't get any points. Fetal tone, they want to see at least one episode of active extension flexion. So it can be like doing this. can be the hand, too, flexion is opening and closing of the hand. Um, so if they have at least one, they get two points. If there's either no movement or there's um, extension, but they don't return to flexion or just partially return to flexion, that's considered abnormal. They get zero points. And then amniotic fluid volume, they're looking for at least one pocket of fluid that's at least a centimeter in two perpendicular planes, again, two points or zero points. Now, occasionally, they used to do, they used a 10-point scale, and they included the NST. So if it was a reactive NST, they got two points. If it was non-reactive, they got zero. Most obstetricians now use an eight-point scale instead. And so what does that mean? So if you have an eight out of eight, um, it's normal and no management is needed. Um, if it's six, yeah, there's some suspicion for asphyxia. Uh, in most cases, they will just repeat the, the BPP in a few hours. Now, if there is oligohydramnios, um, especially if they're at term, they may just decide to go ahead and deliver because that's more of a sign of what's going on chronically. So that's not gonna change and that is, can be concerning. Um, usually they won't go ahead and deliver if it's just oligo, if they're preterm. They'll probably watch them and you know, if they start to see other signs that the baby's not doing well, then they may deliver. Um, four out of six also is suspicious, is more suspicious for asphyxia. And generally, if you've got a baby close to term, like at 36 weeks or greater, and they have a BPP of four out of eight, they're probably going to go ahead and proceed with delivery. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be an emergent C-section. Um, Oftentimes, they will start an induction, and then, you know, they're closely watching the fetal heart rate monitor in terms of how the baby's doing, whether or not the baby's going to tolerate labor. If they're preterm, though, um, and they're four out of eight, oftentimes they will, again, repeat the test and, and see if there's been any improvement. Um, sometimes, though, they may decide to deliver. If it's two out of eight or zero out of eight, that's highly suspicious for fetal asphyxia. And essentially, regardless of gestational age at that point, they are going to be thinking about um, immediate delivery. Now, another thing that you may see them doing, I think they actually did one a week or so ago up here, but not very often, is an oxytocin, oxytocin challenge test, also known as a contraction stress test. Um, and essentially what this is doing is it's, it's assessing how the baby responds to uterine contractions. So, it can be a way to let them know, um, is the baby going to tolerate labor? So that's usually where you're going to see it is where they've decided that they're going to deliver the baby. Maybe she's at term and had a non-reactive NST or something like that. Um, but the concern may be, you know, are we going to labor this patient or are we just going to do a C-section? And so um, to do an oxytocin challenge test, you have to have at least three contractions occurring over a 10-minute period. So essentially, you kind of got to get her into a labor pattern. So there are certain cases then where you can't do an oxytocin challenge test. So you don't want someone with a previous starting to contract because that's going to probably cause them to start bleeding. Um, if you have someone abrupting, you don't want to do that. Um, if there's someone who's at risk for uterine rupture, so you know a, a vertical incision for a C-section, or a myelomectomy. Or if they're preterm, they probably won't do it because if it ended up being a, a negative, which is a good OCT, well then you don't want to do anything. But once you get her contracted, there's a chance she can't get her to stop. So you, like I said, you're not going to see it used very often. And now that they do 
Um, they did this a lot more before they had good ultrasound equipment, but now uh, usually you'll just see them go straight to a BPP if they want more information about fetal status. Um, in terms of an oxytocin challenge test, it's a little bit different in that a negative OCT is what's good. Usually you think of that as bad, but a negative OCT means that there were no decelerations with the contractions is essentially what it means, and so that's reassuring for your fetal status. If you have a positive OCT, that means that um, you had either recurrent late decelerations or severe variable decelerations occurring with at least 50% of the contractions. Um, and in that case, you will suspect fetal asphyxia um, and a much higher association with adverse fetal outcomes. Still, the majority would still have a good fetal outcome, but unlike the NST where it was like 20%, now you're up to like 35 to 40% of um, babies who have a positive OCT will have adverse fetal outcomes. Um, so if you have a positive OCT, um, you're going to see the obstetrician considering an urgent delivery at that point. But like I said, there is a high false positive rate of like at least 50%. Um, so sometimes what they will do if they have a positive OCT, sort of like with the, the biophysical profile, they'll, they'll repeat it. Um, later and see. And in those cases where they repeat it, in over 80% of cases, the repeat OCT will be negative. So um, again, it's it's not a, none of these tests are like super great at predicting the outcome, but better than nothing. So um, those are sort of the antepartum tests. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about was looking after delivery at um, fetal status, and so that is umbilical cord blood gases. Um, the obstetricians will do those. This just shows you kind of what's considered normal, you know, as in terms of what you expect. And when you're looking at it, the things that you're going to look at are um, your pH, of course. Um, but if you have an acidosis, some acidosis are in terms of assessing fetal outcome. Or neonatal outcome, it depends on the type of acidosis you have, so it's important to also look at your CO2, look at your bicarb and your base deficit. Um, and essentially, the types of acidemia you can see as a respiratory, as you, it's just like you know, any acidosis, a respiratory acidosis, acidemia, you have a high PCO2, a normal base bicarb, a normal base deficit. Those are generally not concerning, that there's not research to show that there's any sort of strong association between a, a respiratory acidemia and poor um, outcome for that neonate. Metabolic, um, you have a normal CO2, but a low bicarb and a high base deficit, and then you can have a mixed acidemia combination of both, where you'll have a high PCO2, um, but you'll also have a low bicarb and a high base deficit.